Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm very happy to have Lewis Abramson with us today. Abramson. Hi, folks. Hey, Lewis. How are you doing today? I am doing well. I'm doing well. My face is red because it's hot in Los Angeles. Uh, but other than that, I'm doing just fine. A little sweaty. In Los Angeles today on August 26, 2021. It is a balmy 92 right now, which is our high. Uh, I'm looking forward to when it goes down to 65 later. But Ooh, 90, that's so chilly for Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it must be the Western thing because we're going to hit uh, about 112 F today. So 41, 42 C, something along that order. Um, yeah, nice and toasty today. My sincerest uh, sympathies. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> At least we have water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Touche. Touche. No fire. And no fire. <laughs> Double touche. Very good. All right. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so you're obviously in your home office there. Yep. I'm in Hollywood. For those of you who know Los Angeles, right in the Ooh. center of everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm home alone today. My girlfriend's a professor at USC, so she's she's graciously given me her workspace, which is where I'm sitting. Usually, I have the bedroom in the back. Uh, well. You know, you're in Hollywood and you just mentioned Home Alone. So, you know, um, it all fits. <laughs> yeah, I'm rolling marbles downstairs and stuff <laughs> after this. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Lewis, what do you like to do for research? Uh, I'm a fellow at the Carnegie Observatories uh, right now. And what I what I do and have been doing for the past five years, I, I mean, so I, I graduated in 2015 with my PhD. And I think leading up to that, um, I've been interested in galaxy evolution principally, but uh, really trying to get at uh, how individual galaxies grow over time. So trying to move away from the ensemble observations we have of galaxy populations, mm -hmm. the mass function, for example, and trying to dig down into individual objects and using their colors uh, and some detailed modeling, try to piece together, okay, this galaxy built half of its mass five gig years ago to now, et cetera. Cool. And how the, and, you know, once you map that diversity, what that tells us about physics. So I'm cool. interested in galaxy evolution, but at a granular level, I say, um, although for distant objects, I don't really work below. I, I, don't, I don't do, you know, resolved color magnitude diagrams or stuff. It's all integrated light. There we go. <laughs> very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome research note with the also oh provocative title, at least one in six galaxies is always dead. And Lewis, take us away. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks Frank. The uh, I'm pro provocative title seem, seem to be a trademark of mine. And then you can see my co-author Dan Kelson, uh, for those of you who know him, is also uh, not a shy bird. So uh, we were happy to, to make this bold claim, but we are very eager for folks in the audience to go test it. And we'll get to that later, but... Um, so what this is about is, uh, for those of you who know me and us, um, we've been thinking about at Carnegie, like the kind of mathematical underpinnings of star formation history. So I think if any of you have fit a star formation, uh, a spectral energy distribution before, colors of galaxies with a model, mm -hmm. you may have used something called like an exponential star formation history, uh, which is something that monotonically falls or rises like an exponential curve over time. Uh, I, when I was in graduate school, uh, worked with my advisor, Mike Ladders, on log normal star formation histories, which are also a parameterization that goes up and down. Um, and so each one of these assumptions, you know, uh, allows there to be a different suite of inferable star formation histories from data. Uh, but in recent years, Dan and I, and really Dan has pioneered sort of taking a much more abstract, higher level approach to this and thinking about math that's really, it's still the math that I'm going to talk about today is like still being worked on in math departments. I was very, very happy that I, I, I got to graduate level math as an astrophysicist. I got to ask a, a professor at UCLA about this. So, but, so it's still cutting edge, but um, the kind of histories that Dan likes and that actually reflect uh, the real universe to a quite uh, good extent are called, it's a big word, they're called um, stochastic processes or fractional Brownian motion, but really, there's sums of random numbers where usually where every next number is totally independent of the previous number, you can just tune it up or down so that either the changes from the previous time step bias you towards that direction. So if you went up before, you're gonna go up again on average mm -hmm. or away from that direction. Like if you went mm -hmm. up before you go down in the next direction. Okay. 
And so this is the suite of star formation histories that we've been playing with for the past five years or so. And this paper is an exploration of the implications of that math or that universe for something that's very readily observable that we all know and love, the fraction of passive galaxies. Mm -hmm. Just the red and dead things, what you should expect to see if this were true at any time in the universe uh, for the number of objects that are not forming stars. Okay. So that's what this is about. And it's a very simple calculation that shows uh, what our expectation is in this. And that allows people to go forward and try to break it and tell, tell us we're wrong later. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So do you want to, you want to, uh, you want to just keep going here? Yeah. Let's okay, great. About, let's talk about uh, equation one and two here. Okay. So uh, really what this framework uh, has in it is just one parameter. It's a special parameter called H. Uh, it's the first parameter. This is from, yes, it's, this is from uh, a math that was developed a long time ago. Mandelbrot and Van Ness wrote a really, really good paper on this in 1968. Okay. I highly recommend reading it. It's very easy to read. It's not complex stuff, but this H, this H parameter is entirely responsible for how random the walk is. Right. So for, so, so for example, uh, as you can see here, the next draw in your random series is biased by a factor of H to the minus one half based on the previous draws. What this means is that when H is one half, there's no bias at all. And you get a purely ran, random Brownian walk like you did before. Yep. But when H is more than a half, changes are biased, future changes are biased in the same direction as past changes. Okay. So again, if, if on average you were going up before, <laughs> you will continue to go up on average mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa. So the first two equations here, uh, what, what this does is it allows you to predict the bulk behavior of, ga of galaxies deterministically. While every individual track is random to some extent, and therefore you can't say much about it. In the ensemble, when you take thousands of galaxies, the mean behavior and the dispersion of that ensemble are very, very well predicted. They're one-to-one -one functions of H. So okay. here's equations one and two. What this shows you is that in, in, in this set mathematical framing, the mean star formation rate of a set of objects, this is equation one, grows like t to the h. Mm -hmm. So when t is a half, it grows like the square root of h. This is, you know this from Brownian motion, from, from thermodynamics. And when, t, when h is one, it grows like time. So as you correlate the star formation histories more, the mean rises faster. Yes. OK, so that means that the average star formation rate grows as a function of time for this ensemble that's sensitive to h. But the other thing we can predict is the dispersion. So how far on average a galaxy will lie away from the mean? And it turns out that's also a function of h. And this is equation two. Okay. It's, it's a function such that it's the square root of h times the mean. And this is where the whole paper comes in. So equation two says that if h is less than one, the dispersion in star formation rates is always growing slower than the mean. Right. And since the mean is rising, that means you're always getting things farther from zero on average. Uh -huh. the, the special case is when H is one, in which case the dispersion is growing at exactly the same rate as the mean, so that there's always the same fraction of objects, one sigma away, two sigma away at zero, no matter the time step. And so this is, this is where the passive fraction comes in. Cool. Because H controls how far on every future time step a galaxy will on average wander below the median star formation rate, Mm -hmm. It controls how many galaxies will be at zero, which tells you that the passive fraction is a constraint on the stochasticity of the random walk. On, Got it. I'm with on you. H. I'm with you. Uh -huh. Okay, so the whole paper, that's it. The paper is just saying the passive fraction should smell the correlation factor. Yes. Let's, let's, we can do it numerically from scratch in Dan's model, and then let's plot that up against data and see if it's right. Okay. That's, that's figure one. Let's take a look at figure one. Let's get a uh, let's get a pretty version of that. There we go. Okay. All right. Ignore the ignore the right hand panel here for now. Okay. The left hand panel at the bottom it has different values of h. It goes from a half, which remember is purely random, over to one, which is maximally correlated. And then this black line with the little orange error bar around it is the fraction of galaxies at the at the end of the chain, we'll talk about that in a second, that have zero star formation rate that are passive. Mm -hmm. And you can see that when, when, when the walk is totally random, it's down below 5%. And when it's totally correlated, it's up around 16% on H equals one. And this is the trend. Yep. 
Now, what is that? So that's okay. So what does data say? And it turns out that when you look at all sorts of data sets from very low redshift uh, dwarf galaxies up to high redshift measurements, they all kind of lie around 15 to 20% passive fractions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can go through I can go through these objects, but it's really like the turquoise lines here are all low redshift measurements. Okay. Uh -huh. thing of, so the, yeah, all the turquoise measurements are like either um, the, and you can see the mass ranges there and the redshifts there. You're highlighting them. Mm -hmm. At low redshift, uh, you have to go to low masses because Dan's math it breaks. Uh, anywhere where star formation rates aren't rising. Like we saw before that the mean star formation rate is always rising with time, no matter what age, equation one showed us, it's always rising in time. Mm -hmm. But we know, for example, that massive galaxies today, a lot of them are passive. And so at some level, the model becomes, you need to update the model. We're not talking about quenching, that's called quenching. But in at any redshift where median star formation rates are rising, Dan's model holds. And at low redshifts, that's at low mass. Okay. And so, so today, the low mass passive fraction is a good is a good test of what this model should predict, and they all sort of lie between fifteen and twenty percent. Yep. What happens at high redshift? So at high redshift, we know that the star median star formation rate is rising. We know the Medal plot is going up. Yep. And so there are a couple. These measurements are pretty nascent, and they're hard to make. And there's only a couple of them that I have here, but those are the purple lines. Right. And you can see that uh, from one paper, natively, it comes out at 18%. And then there's another paper where it came out at 9% uh, right there. Uh, but it turns out that when the way they were defining what passive galaxies are was based on a cut in, in a two color space, it's called the okay. UVJ diagram. Okay. And it was based on a cut defined at very low redshift. And it turns out that you have to evolve this cut to higher edge because galaxy colors get bluer closer to the beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. And once you make that correction, it goes back up to 16% and falls right where the data are. So what this plot says is that data from high red shifts where the star formation rate of everything is rising, which is where Dan's model applies directly, and data at low red shift in the regime where Dan's model applies, which is at low masses, all the data are consistent with H equals about one. Which is, which is maximally correlated histories. Now, yes. this is interesting because in previous work in many other papers, Dan and Dan and I, and Dan and I and Andrew Benson have shown that H equals one is also what you get from other directions, principally three other directions. The evolution of the stellar mass star formation plane, okay. that gives you H equals one. The evolution of the stellar mass function okay. over time, that gives you H equals one. And also, the evolution of the density distribution of galaxy environments over time, that gives you H equals one. And the first two there are kind of related to each other through the star formation rate, but the third one is really a result purely of Newtonian physics. Yeah. We show this in, a, in our 2020 paper. Um, and so there are like many different angles that suggest that H is one. So we believe that that's a good answer. And it just so happens that the passive fraction also supports that. So what this means, now we'll go over to the right-hand panel and then, and then I, can, I can take questions or stop talking for a while. This has another pretty big implication. It means that the passive fraction is, should be independent of time. Mm -hmm. Because from various other, from smart people who are statisticians who study math, who this is again, sort of a new, new not, not yet fully mature field. They've worked out that the fraction of objects that should be close to zero in a, in a, in a H equals one random walk Mm -hmm. goes like time to the h minus one power. Okay. And so for the same values of h I plot on the left here, on the right, I'm showing the trend in the passive fraction over time, over these 600 time steps. Okay. And for the bottom ones here for h, you know, a half, two thirds and three quarters or whatever it is, you can see that those dashed lines, which reflect h e t to the h minus one, they all go right through the tracks, which is exactly what the math should say. Yep. When, so of course, the only value where this doesn't evolve over time is at h equals one. And you almost see that it's a very slow power because of numerical problems, I guess, uh, for h equals one in my math, but it's, um, it should be flat at 16%. And anyway, it's a, we get it that it's, okay, 0.92 as opposed to h equals one. But anyway, cool. why is this important? It's important because everything that's not h equals one has the passive fraction going down with time. Yes. And every single data set we've ever examined says, if anything, it has to go the other way. 
So there's also just sort of like a zeroth order gut check answer that says this number can't be less than, h can't be less than one because the passive fraction never evolves down in time. And so if it is h equals one, then this intrinsic okay. passive floor should be totally independent of time. We should see the same number of passive objects at redshift six, seven, eight, nine, 12, four, three, two, one, zero, as long as you're in the regime where star formation rates are rising on average. Right. So this is our prediction. So cool. to put a button on it, our prediction is that no matter what sample you look at in James Webb, if you were to make the appropriate color color cut, you would find that 16% of objects are not currently forming stars. And we're looking forward to people going out and testing that as soon as that telescope uh, hits space. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. Indeed. And so that'll wrap up this research note. So Lewis, thank you so much for walking us through that and uh, giving us a little context on the history of the, uh, this is not the first time that you guys have done this. Um, so very nice. And you mentioned a little bit about JWST. I, yeah. uh, you know, I, I imagine Dan and maybe other people, or they already got their proposals in, or people lining up to do this on JWST, or maybe something like Vera Rubin uh, could mm -hmm. help out. Are there maybe theoretical calculations that could be done? So um, where do we go, let's say, over the next five years to confirm or refute your 16% one and six? <clears throat> well, cer certainly one thing that can be done is you could look at simulations right now and see if this is uh, sort of what they get. Uh, we, know, we know that H equal one histories describe dwarf galaxies quite well. And so if you have simulations that are designed to build dwarf galaxies, we would expect, or they can, that can reproduce dwarf galaxies, we should expect them to produce this kind of behavior. If they don't, we're learning something interesting about the simulations, if not reality. But on the observational side, which is obviously the easiest way to confront this, um, I don't know of anybody. So I'm on the JWST ERS team, and I will encourage those folks to make this measurement where they can. Um, but it should just be dead simple. I mean, you don't really have to do any dedicated observation for this. As long as you've got enough colors to span an SED, anybody who wants to uh, should be able to measure their passive fraction. Anybody who's doing the mass function who's going to split it by star forming and passive galaxy is going to do this automatically. Mm -hmm. So I expect that as soon as James Webb flies, uh, this will get tested very, very quickly. Um, and even by people who don't mean to. Uh, for other things, I think one thing that's interesting to think about doing this with, maybe not, um, uh, well, I, I would say, maybe not with Vera Rubin, but with Nancy Roman, the, with the, the wide field infrared survey telescope that's going to fly. Um, Co yeah, okay. Correlating this measurement with a de local density to see if, um, to see if you can kind of, if you can see when environment starts to become a factor that drives you away from this from this floor towards a higher fraction. We know today that in you know, the coma cluster, everything's dead. Mm -hmm. We know env environment correlates with the passive fraction and, and Dan's math doesn't describe that. And yeah. so you could start to see whether, where, if for example, at Redshift three environment had no effect or even if that early in the, in the universe's history that's having an effect. And then through those deviations from the floor, uh, start to build more physical intuition. So I think those are two good things to do in the next, I suppose, uh, the Nancy Roman telescope won't fly for maybe 10 more years, but yeah. in the next few years uh, to do that. And, and then the other side, the last thing I'll say is, you know, what I have learned is that it's really good to take just a step back. Like everybody is so focused on using data. Everybody is so focused on taking their favorite picture and measuring their favorite quantity from it. Mm -hmm. But I have learned a lot by taking a step back and thinking about the structures with which we approach the data. Like, is h equals one the right perspective with which to look at the data? Are log normal histories the, a better perspective to look at the data? From a, from, a, from a structural standpoint, what can you learn about the universe? Not by the individual, I'm kind of came back on where I started this conversation, not by the individual galaxies, but by looking at the, the, mechanical, the mechanical bones of the models that we're bringing to bear. And I think we are kind of still at the beginning of thinking about, well, what does it mean uh, philosophically to, to say that galaxies have random walks or to say that galaxies ha uh, have more structured histories, or for example, to say that you can associate progenitors to descendants by doing things like abundance matching. Like what, mm -hmm. what, what, what avenues or answers does that open our eyes to? And what does it close our, close our frames of reference off to. And, and I think that that's something I would encourage young students to dive into um, 
uh, if they if it strikes their fancy. Mechanical bones. I love that um, turn of phrase. That was very nice. <laughs> very cool. <clears throat> All right. Lewis, thank you once again for walking us through your lovely research note. It's very great. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you everyone for listening in. And I hope this makes your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Take it easy, folks.